In 1942, German U-boats were decimating British shipping in the North Atlantic. Between January and February of 1942, Germans had sunk over 150,000 tons of Allied ship weight without losing a single U-boat by using the Wolfpack strategy. In October alone, an additional 56 Allied ships were sunk. The Allied forces were desperate to fight back, but had no way to take their anti-submarine aircraft to the region, being too far from land, and with the icy conditions making it inaccessible for aircraft carriers. To make matters worse, Britain was struggling to access the necessary raw materials, particularly steel, for continued development of new ships and aircraft. Desperate for ideas, Lord Mountbatten and Winston Churchill were approached by Geoffrey Pike, who intended to fashion a solution out of the problem. Daring to imagine a fleet of mobile and unsinkable carriers made of ice, and a series of promising tests would ultimately lead to the creation of a top-secret thousand-ton prototype in the middle of a lake. Geoffrey Pike was a British Orthodox Jew studying law at Pembroke College when the First World War began. He cast his studies aside, convincing an editor of the Daily Chronicle newspaper to fund a trip to Germany so that he could report on the sentiments and perceptions of the Germans. Using an American sailor's passport, he arrived in Berlin, but within only six days he aroused suspicion and was arrested. He was kept in confinement for 13 weeks, during which time he whistled and recited poems to withstand the loneliness. He was moved from prison to prison until the Germans sent him to the Ruhrleben internment camp. While in internment, he suffered from double pneumonia and constant food poisoning. The situation became unbearable to the point that he decided to escape or die trying. On July 9, 1915, he and fellow Briton Edward Falk hid in a hut under tennis nets past noon. When the guard checked the hut, he did not notice them as the two prisoners succeeded in using the sun's glare to conceal themselves. Once night fell, they ran out and climbed over multiple fences towards freedom. Pike and Falk trekked all the way to the Dutch border and found a way back to England once they were free in the Netherlands. While Pike's mission to gather insight on the German civilian population had failed, he returned to England with a far more powerful story, that of an escaped prisoner of war. A telegram he had sent from Amsterdam had circulated in the paper with a high degree of readership among Londoners. Pike jumped on that success by publishing a memoir in 1960 entitled Rulaban and Back. As a freed prisoner of war, he was exempted from the draft and dedicated his time to altruistic endeavors. He opened up an experimental school based on the philosophy of John Dewey. It focused on freedom and rewards over punishments, with students being viewed as researchers rather than pupils. When funding ran dry, he was forced to close it and shifted his focus to volunteering efforts that provided aid to Spaniards during their civil war. As Hitler rose to power, he began collecting research and data that contradicted his anti-Semitic talking points. In 1939, he began work on an opinion poll that would gauge the honest opinions of Germans about Hitler's regime. He sent volunteers to Germany that would in turn disguise the questions as part of ordinary conversations. His British spies were largely undetected, and the work concluded in August, he turned in a report to the British War Office and partook in a broadcast about the subject for the BBC. Once Germany invaded Norway, Pike dedicated his energy to the issue of soldier transportation in cold temperatures. Through his friend, the Irish scientist John Desmond Bernal, he submitted a proposal for a screw-propelled vehicle to the Combined Operations Headquarters. His proposal was rejected until Lord Louis Mountbatten, a friend of Bernal, took over as Chief of Combined Operations. With recommendations from both Bernal and Leopold Amory, Pike's proposal was reviewed again. Lord Mountbatten was deeply impressed and brought Pike onto his staff. The Lord believed his new staff member to be a genius who was unafraid to think outside the box. Together they began Project Plough, which sought to provide snow vehicles for military operations. The project resulted in the creation of the M29 Weasel, of which the U.S. built hundreds. While he was in the United States working on production of the vehicles, he thought of yet another solution to a major military quandary. 
since aircraft carriers were not yet capable of navigating frozen waters, and there was a shortage of aluminum and steel, he envisioned that perhaps ice itself could be used to provide a home base for aircraft. Pike couldn't wait to return to England to share his proposal, so instead he sent a reportedly 232-page document in a diplomatic bag to the Combined Operations Headquarters, with explicit instructions that only Lord Mountbatten could open the package. Once Mountbatten read the proposal, he shared it with Winston Churchill, who thought it would be a pursuable endeavor. Soon after, Pike accessed a research paper by Austrian-American chemist Hermann Mark that would change and improve what he had originally thought of. The research paper talked about a frozen ice alloy made of a small percentage of sawdust or other wood pulp combined with ice. The material provided benefits such as low thermal conductivity, which means it would melt ever so slowly, and it improved the density of purely water-based ice, making it stronger. The resulting substance was similar to concrete, so long as it stayed frozen. Better yet, the durable and sturdy ice alloy could be molded into any shape and then frozen. As for the name of this material, collaborator Max Peretz wrote in his book, I Wish I'd Made You Angry Earlier, quote, Blocks of ice containing as little as 4% wood pulp were weight for weight as strong as concrete. In honor of the originator of the project, we called this reinforced ice Pycrete. When we fired a rifle bullet into an upright block of pure ice two feet square and one foot thick, the block shattered. In Pycrete, the bullet made a little crater and was embedded without doing any damage. Lord Mountbatten continued to be a strong supporter of Pycrete. Reports, including an entry in Sir Alan Brooks' diaries, claimed that he presented a block of the material at the 1943 Quebec Conference to generals and admirals accompanying Churchill and President Roosevelt. At a meeting, he placed a regular block of ice and a Pycrete block next to each other. He proceeded to shoot the block of ice, which shattered as expected. When he fired at the Pycrete block, it didn't shatter, but the bullet ricocheted into the wall almost hitting Admiral Ernest King on its way. Sir Alan Brooke, who wrote down the first incident, was the subject of another ricocheted bullet, when a lieutenant at Combined Operations Headquarters was carrying out a similar demonstration and the bullet bounced off his and Brooke's shoulder. Thankfully, no reported injury came of it. Pike's novel idea to have an aircraft carrier made of ice moved on to the prototype phase in 1944 as Project Habakkuk. Jasper National Park in Canada was chosen as the test site, with Patricia Lake serving as the spot to test insulation and flotation. Unfortunately, Pike himself was kept at a distance from the project in order to maintain American involvement, since he had been removed from Project Plow after multiple conflicts with U.S. military personnel. Bernal informed Combined Operations of the prototype plans, and in turn, Churchill ordered that if assessment of the construction were positive, multiple ships would be subsequently built. 300,000 tons of wood pulp, 35,000 tons of timber, and 10,000 tons of steel, along with 25,000 tons of insulating fiberboard, were allocated to the prototype, for a cost of around 700,000 British pounds. The prototype was built by conscientious objectors to the war, who were not aware of what they were building. The result was an 18 by 9 meter, 1,000 ton Pycrete ship held in place by a small one horsepower motor. Through experimentation at Smithfield Market, Max Peretz contributed that the optimal mixture for Pycrete had 14% wood for 86% ice. However, this precision was not included in time. The prototype was slowly melting and deforming with Pycrete exhibiting creep, a tendency of certain solids to deteriorate under mechanical stress over time. This meant that more steel and insulation would be necessary to make a functional vessel. Estimated costs went up to two and a half million British pounds. While Bernal and Peretz continued working on Habakkuk, the needs and demands for a better and more efficient ship haunted the project. The military needed the ship to be able to fend off large waves and torpedoes while having a range of 7,000 miles. This required a thickness of 40 feet 
and a deck of 2,000 feet for heavy bombers to take off from. Steering became a problem, as the original concept calling for movement to be controlled by motors on the sides was ineffective, and no rudder could be installed at the correct depth. Professor Susan Langley of St. Mary's College of Maryland stated in an interview with CNN that, quote, One problem was that if you wanted to launch aircraft off of something, it had to have 50 feet of freeboard above the water, but because icebergs are 90% submerged, that meant having almost 500 feet below the water. Making matters worse, Hikrete turned out to be more challenging to accurately use than concrete, since it expanded during freezing. Despite all this, three different versions of the Habakkuk project were presented in 1943, with Bernal still believing in the material. Habakkuk 1 was intended to be made purely of wood, while Habakkuk 2 would have been a self-propelled ship of 1,200 meters by 180 made of pikrete and steel. The last proposed ship, Habakkuk 3, was intended to be a smaller and faster version. None of these designs would ever be more than ideas. At the beginning of 1943, both Churchill and Lord Mountbatten were supportive of Project Habakkuk. Once all the complications came to light, Lord Mountbatten fully withdrew from the project. His departure marked the beginning of the end. The last meeting concerning Project Habakkuk happened in December of 1943, with everyone present concluding that the ice ship was unviable. Again, from the book I Wish I Made You Angry Earlier, Max Perrett acknowledged that, quote, the enormous amount of steel needed for the refrigeration plant that was to freeze the pikrete was greater than that needed to build the entire carrier of steel, but the crucial argument was that the rapidly increasing range of land-based aircraft rendered floating islands unnecessary. As for Mr. Pike, John Desmond Bernal wrote, quote, He remained always the knight errant, from time to time gathering round him a small band of followers, but never a leader of big movements. Because of the very greatness of his ideas, most of his life was one of frustration and disappointment. <laughs> 